Everybody, I'm Don Shane, live at Schembechler Hall on the eve of the 94th meeting between Michigan and Ohio State. This museum is filled with a lot of Michigan football history and tradition, and a lot of it deals with this game. And do you know that for only the seventh time in the history of this rivalry, both of these teams are ranked in the top five in the nation? Let's review some of those games when that occurred. How about back in 1968 with Woody Hayes and Jim Otis and Rex Kerr? 50 to 14 Ohio State won and Woody went for the two-point conversion late it was not very pleasant around here when that happened in 73 Dennis Franklin broke his collarbone in the 10-10 tie Michigan was voted out of the Rose Bowl by the athletic directors Bo wasn't happy with that in 74 Mike Lantry had a chance to win it he thought he made this field goal he missed 12-10 Ohio State won in 1977 Michigan won 14 to 6 the first time they ever beat Woody Hayes back to back. Around here, this is the greatest rivalry in college football, and at times, players from both sides have popped off. The latest came from Buckeyes wide receiver David Boston, who last Saturday said, if our offense and our defense are clicking, we should beat them by two to three touchdowns. We're going up there to upset them. I think we're better than Michigan. When told about this boast, Charles Woodson responded by saying this. Well, I mean, that's a strong statement, but I think if our offensive defense clicks, then we should win by two touchdowns. <laughs> so, um, I mean, it'll be a great game. We know they'll come to play, but we'll be ready for them when they come up here. But Boston wasn't done. He compared his teammate, Antoine Winfield, to Michigan's Heisman Trophy candidate Woodson himself. According to Boston, Winfield is, quote, as good as Woodson and certainly faster. The Michigan players had a little something to say about Boston's boasting. If those guys want to talk, you know, let them talk. But the game is going to be played on the field. And um, you can do all the talking you want. But um, you got to make plays on the field. And um, that's what's going to determine the outcome of this ball game. Well, it gets everybody ready. I mean, it's a challenge. Uh, just like the last couple of weeks, our team has been called out in, in different ways. And, uh, when you get called out, you got to step up to the challenge. You have to be careful of what you say because any comment or negative comment that you make in a uh, fuel, and you can give fuel to an opposing team and give them more will to uh, go out there and uh, want to beat you. Uh, but right now, I think uh, we're being very humble. I think uh, we're uh, very confident in ourselves, and uh, we know we have a, a great respect for Ohio State, but we also have a great respect for ourselves, and we know uh, what we're capable of. Now, you know, coaches don't want players sounding off at any time, but they're kids, and it happens, and they're going to say stuff, and a lot of people think it has absolutely no effect on this game. The game tomorrow means everything. In fact, if you don't think it's important, listen to what Ohio State coach John Cooper says about it. This game is it's almost, uh, you know, it's almost bigger than life. It's, it's originated a long, long time ago, and, uh, you know, Coach Schimbecker and Coach Hayes had some great battles, and, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're neighboring states. Uh, they recruit down here. We recruit up there. Uh, hey, John, so get a life. I know it's difficult in Columbus when you lose to the Wolverines and you get carried off the field when you win, but it's not the most important thing in the world. And this week, Cooper admitted that he prepares his team differently during Michigan week, and he's been criticized for that approach and that thinking. But there's no game year in and year out that is more significant, that has more meaning, that has more of an impact on on the bowl, scheme, the bowl scene or the national championship, I think, than the Ohio State-Michigan game. Regardless of... Uh, what we've done in the past, this game, which is the biggest rival uh, re we, uh, that we have at Michigan, it's uh, my estimation, uh, one of the very great rivalries in college athletics, and uh, it'll be played uh, in a great arena on national television. If you have red blood, you're excited and you'll be ready to play. They may be a little bit more pressure this particular year on Michigan because they're the number one team in the country and they're they're, they're, they were supposed to, you know, play for the championship. We, we, we lost all of our players last year. Yeah, right. He doesn't have any players. He's won every game except for the one at Penn State. Hey, he must be important. They named this building after him. I'm talking about Bo. In his career against the Buckeyes, 11 wins, 9 losses, 1 tie. We will talk live with Bo about this game and this rivalry when we continue live from Ann Arbor.
I'm Beckler Hall. You know, so much of what you see here relates to what happened when Bo coached here. Winningest coach in the history of Michigan football. Never had a losing season, and some even credit him with starting what is called the Cold War. When he upset Woody back in 69, the next 10 years were something fierce in this rivalry. Behind me is the theater, and they play a video here called The Michigan Tradition. And it's something that I think Mr. Schembechler has seen many, many times, but he's in here watching it anyway. How are you this evening as you watch some, uh, say, some tape of Michigan football? Let me talk yeah. first about 1969 and Woody Hayes and that upset win. Did that forever change the nature of this rivalry and maybe the way people looked at this rivalry? I think the rivalry changed when Woody ran up 50 points the year before. And the Michigan players didn't forget that. And then uh, we upset them here in 69, and Woody admittedly said that that was the greatest football team he ever had. And he also, did he not say that you would never have a yeah. win? Yeah, he accused me of that at a banquet in front of about 500 of his ex-players. Was he right? <laughs> and he was right. He was absolutely right. Woody could get very upset. He ripped up sideline markers one time. Everybody knows he punched a player one time. Uh, it was just... A, a situation, I presume, where he was maybe the most competitive human being you've ever encountered? Well, he's, uh, yeah, I would say he's as competitive as anybody that I've run into. Yeah. Now, you beat those guys, as you mentioned, in 69 and in your last game in 89. Reflect right. back on those times and, and maybe what this rivalry meant to you and those two games meant to you. Well, of course, the last time that we beat them was the last game that I coached in Michigan Stadium. So although um, I didn't know for sure that that would be the last game, I had an inclination that that might be my last game. And the first one, of course, you know, there's, you know, I just never had a game like that. It meant so much, so much uh, electricity in the air and players so uh, jacked up to just do everything they could to win that game. Um, I'll never forget that one. Okay, we'll talk more about this rivalry, but let's do it in front of your exhibit. Right. What do you say that? We come okay. out this way. Hey, I know you were a part of this for so many years. Is this, and I know what your answer is going to be, so I feel silly answering, but people say it's the greatest rivalry in the history of college football. Is it? It is the greatest rivalry in college football. Now, why? I, I believe that. Why? Well, uh, for this reason. Uh, it's been going on for a long time, <laughs> and we always play in the last game of the year, and uh, very often, as it is this year, um, we're playing for the Big Ten Championship, the National Championship, the Rose Bowl, the rankings, whatever. We're playing for it all. But is it better than USC and UCLA? Oh, my God. All right, is it better than Auburn and Alabama? Oh, my <laughs> Is it better than Florida, Florida State? They're also playing tomorrow. Our, well, our, our rivalry with Michigan State is equal to Auburn and Alabama, but this is special absolutely special because these two teams have been the dominant teams in the Big Ten Conference historically mm -hmm. and they play in the last game of the year and very often something real important at stake Right. as it is here. All right, the last few years, this Michigan team has really ruined it for Ohio State. Gone down, beating them here, beating them there when Ohio State had everything riding on it. Now the situation's a little bit reversed. Does that have an impact on this game? No. And the reason that it doesn't, <laughs> the reason that it doesn't is that there is enormous incentive on both sides. So that means that both teams are going to play as hard as they possibly can in order to win. You don't need any more motivation than both of these teams have. So all of this other stuff is not going to mean much. And what these coaches ought to do, which I never <laughs> did, but they ought to do, <laughs> okay. is to sit back and let these hunting dogs hunt and see who the better team is. Now, you really don't have to do much, do you? I mean, what could you possibly say to these players? They know everything about Oh, yeah, about you don't have to do much there. But you, you continually, uh, both just before the game and during the course of the game, must be talking assignments, adjustments, strategy. All of those things continue because you have to do a great job of orchestrating this game from your sideline mm -hmm. and be sure that you're calling the right things and doing the right things. Mm -hmm. So the game isn't over. You just don't go out there and play. There's a lot that's going to be going on on the sideline. Lloyd Carr has beaten John Cooper twice. 
Cooper's had a very difficult time. One win, seven losses, one time against Michigan. They are all over him down there. He's done everything but consistently beat Michigan. I don't want to say to you, feel sorry for the guy, but is it unfair, the value and the importance that we're placing on this, or are you in it to do this kind of a thing and win anyway, and therefore you are subjected to the criticism? Well, uh, I sympathize with him. Uh, there has been... A modest criticism of my bowl record. <laughs> <laughs> More than modest, I'm More than add. modest. Yeah. And so I can uh, understand how he feels. But, uh, you know, you're only as good as the last game that you played in this series. It is, if he wins the game, the fact that he's 2 7 and 1 isn't going to make that much difference because he won the last time out. But if he loses again, and these things keep going on and on, well, uh, they'll never, ever let you forget it. I know you'll never pick against Michigan, so I'm not going to ask you that. But if you really felt Ohio State was going to win the game, would you tell me? Hello? No. <laughs> I'm not telling you that. Because I, I, I can swear to you, there was one time, and I apologize to Lloyd for this, I didn't think they had a chance to beat them last year. And they did. And they did. We'll see you tomorrow morning when we talk more about okay, this game. Okay, Don, looking right. forward to it. Coming up next, the Michigan players talking about this game and this rivalry and their intense desire to stay unbeaten and win the Big Ten and go to the Rose Bowl. That and more when we continue live from Schembeckler Hall. Welcome back. You know, the seniors on this Michigan football team have never been to the Rose Bowl, and I would bet you that they never imagined that possible when they decided to come to Michigan. The last time Michigan went to the Rose Bowl was back in 1993, and they beat Washington, and it was a terrific game. Now, if Michigan loses tomorrow, they can still go to Pasadena, but the Michigan players aren't thinking about losing and sharing the Big Ten title. Sometimes you have to be selfish, you know. We don't want to be co-Big Ten champs, you know. We had the opportunity to win the Big Ten championship outright, and um, we got to take advantage of that opportunity. There's a lot, been a lot of scenarios going on on how we could get to the Rose Bowl if this happens, if this happens. But the, the one scenario that we're worried about is uh, winning this uh, Big Ten uh, championship outright. Of course, Ohio State went to the Rose Bowl last year after losing to Michigan. They beat Arizona State out in that Rose Bowl. And you know what? A lot of Buckeye fans would say, hey, they would rather beat Michigan and not go to Pasadena. Last year, down in Columbus, this was the key play that turned it all around for Michigan. Brian Greasy to tie streets, 69-yard TD. The Wolverines upset then number two ranked Ohio State, 13-9. It ended their national championship dreams. Tomorrow, the Bucks hope to disappoint Michigan in the exact same manner. We have had tremendous leadership, and uh, you know we've won uh, all of our games at home this year. So, of course, to, to finish the season. Uh, with your last game against Ohio State is always an emotional thing, but that can work against you. Uh, the thing we have to make sure that we do is pay attention to the little things, to the details that are critical in winning a big game. I don't think that we're going to have a whole, whole lot of pressure on us because our coaching staff has done a great job of keeping us prepared mentally and physically, and, we're, and we know what's at stake here, and we're just going to go out and play this game hard. Obviously, Ohio State wants very badly to ruin Michigan's season. When we come back, a story about a unique man, and he has a special place in this museum. That and more when we continue live from Ann Arbor. Beckler Hall. Tomorrow there will be a man watching this football game who holds a very special place in Michigan football history. His name is Laverne Taylor, but as Eric Smith tells us, his friends call him Kip. October 1st, 1927, Michigan ball, third down on the Ohio 28. Gilbert takes the snap, he drops back, looks to his right. It's a short pass to Taylor, he's got it. Into the corner, he scampers, touchdown, Michigan. The first touchdown at the brand new 84,000 seat Michigan Stadium. What a move by the 19 year old sophomore from Ann Arbor. What was it like? When you came down that tunnel and, and came into this great big bowl the first time. I was scared to death. <laughs> really? Sure. What, now you had a big uniform on? And... I know, but that didn't mean anything. But you guys win the game? Well, you know it's 33 zip. 33 zip? Yeah. And who were you playing? Wayne State? 
I'm not Slippery Rock normal. <laughs> Today, that sophomore right end is turning 90. Kip, don't call me Laverne Taylor, is once again back on the hallowed sod in the house that Fielding Yost built 70 years ago. So what did the quarterback say? He says he's got Oosterbahn on one side, he's got you on one side. Well, all he said was, I said, throw the ball to me, I'm wide open. He said, shut up, you damn sophomore. So I shut up, two or three plays later, here comes the saying, I said, pass play, and I said, here we go again. <laughs> and we went out of the huddle, Louis Gilbert, out of Kalamazoo, said, listen, tail, that's what they call me, You're listen, nickname. tail, if I throw this ball to her, by God, you better catch it. <laughs> I said, I guess that's a lot of pressure on you. Oh, I better catch it. Him. Right here, no problem. And that was the nice light touch. And, oh, yes. Well, Kip didn't have a great career on the gridiron. He only walked the long tunnel at Michigan's huge stadium in uniform on two occasions. Because on a cold fall day in Wisconsin, Kip Taylor broke his neck, but not his Michigan spirit. Did you ever score another touchdown? Never. That was it. That was it. But what a claim to fame. Uh, you scored the first touchdown in this magnificent stadium. But I'd have given anything in the world if I could have played three years. I wouldn't have cared whether I scored the first touchdown or not. His playing days behind him, Kip Taylor headed for the sidelines to become Coach Taylor from Ann Arbor Pioneer High all the way out west to Oregon State. Here on WAAM, yes. Hi, Kip. How are you doing today? Well, pretty good. How are you? Okay, buddy. You he know. has become a celebrity of sorts, chatting it up about football on the local radio sports show. So I looked up in the bleachers, and here sits Lou Holloway, and I thought, well, what in the name of heavens is he doing here? He's That's always got a story to tell or a piece oh, yeah. of history to share. He says, you know, I can go across that goal line... A hundred times. It but he's always the coach. Times. It doesn't mean a thing. It doesn't count a damn point. Unless you got that little brown thing with you. <laughs> and you never forgot it. <laughs> Laverne Taylor may be just an asterisk in the proud history of Michigan football, but he is so much more than that. More than just a footnote or a trivia question. Wouldn't it be fun to do it one more time? Oh, hell, if I, if I could go back and do it over again, you know, Bill. The story of Kip Taylor is a love story about a game, about an institution named Michigan, about a life well lived and thoroughly enjoyed. Does it still give you a thrill, Kip, to come in here? Oh, yes. Sure. Oh. Hell, bells. When, you know, I get a lump in my throat every time I hear him play the victors. I bet you do. Yep, I do. It's my school, my team song, and uh, I wouldn't take anything for that. That's nice, isn't it? It's part of an ongoing series from Eric called From the Heart. You can see stories just like that on Channel 7 each and every Tuesday. That's our program tonight, but tomorrow morning, more profiles of Michigan players, more from Columbus, more with Bo at 1130 when we take another look at this great game and this rivalry. I'm Don Shane. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow morning.